into Petrino's life. Um, I love what Jill said in that video. She said, God uses people in the most ordinary ways. God uses people in the most ordinary ways. Uh, man, someone else's toddler ran up to your toddler's toys, man, and that began a conversation that turned into a relationship that eventually became an invitation. And through the simple power of an invitation, Bailey became the link between the Petrino family and God's grace, and, and their, their lives and their destinies and their eternities are now different because of that simple invitation. Um, and here's what I think is true of you. I know it's true of me. Man, I want to be that for my friends. Like, I want to be that for my neighbors. I want to be that for my family members. And I, I think you probably do, too. Well, this upcoming Friday and Saturday, we are having our fourth annual discipleship conference. Now we can clap for the fourth annual discipleship conference. Here we go. Thank you, Aaron. Thank you. Good. Okay. We need one of you in every service. All right. And, uh, man, we, we are so excited about Decon. And a big shout out. We can clap again to the 107 of you who have already registered. Very excited about that. All right, and, and here is the theme of Decon. It's very simple. It's called Come and See, How to Invite the People Around You to Jesus. How can you become the link between your friends and your family and your coworkers in God's grace? That's what we're going to be talking about all Friday and all Saturday. It's going to be full of really powerful worship sets, impactful keynote, uh, keynote sessions, and just really practical talks about how can you start living this out in your life, okay? So a bunch of people already signed up. If you haven't, it's okay. There's still time, but now is the time to sign up. We're going to be providing child care, t-shirts, resources, all of that. There's a $15 fee that helps us offset that cost. So if you are planning on coming to Decon or you're on the fence, let me encourage you to go ahead and sign up. You won't regret it. It's one of my favorite things we do every year. You can find all the details at centerseville.com backslash decon. And who knows, next year, truly, we could be showing a video about some family whose life and attorney has been completely changed because of you. Because you went to the discipleship conference and you learned how to become the link between your friends and God's grace. So let's pray for decon and then we're going to jump into John 17, okay? God, I thank you that you bridged the gap between heaven and earth in Christ, and now you give us the privilege of bridging the gap between our friends and your grace. So Lord, at Decon and just in our church culture, would you make us a group of people that love to do that? And as we look at John 17, would you teach us about prayer from the prayer life of your son? We pray all this in his name. Amen. Amen. Well, if you have a Bible, you can meet me in John 17, starting in verse 6. John 17, starting in verse 6. We're in week two of a three-week series where we are examining the longest recorded prayer of Jesus in the Bible. The longest recorded prayer of Jesus in the Bible. And we're asking this question. What can we learn about our prayers by listening to Jesus pray? What can we learn about our prayers by listening to Jesus pray? Last week, we talked about how should we pray. This week, we're going to talk about what should we pray. Last was how, this week was what? Because if you start doing last week, you start praying, you're very quickly going to meet this week. What should I be praying about, right? So to kind of give you a sense of, of the landscape, let me share some, the results of a study that was done that asked uh, those who identified as Christian in America uh, what they prayed about, okay? So the number one thing that American Christians pray about at 50% of total prayers is upcoming events, Okay, so, uh, you know, the big meeting I have next week, the exam that I'm studying for Friday, traveling mercies for my vacation. Okay, whatever traveling mercies are. But that's, that's a full 50% of what Americans uh, pray for. Uh, the second uh, most prayed for thing was health issues. Okay, 23% of what's prayed for is health issues. So, you know, I'm talking about Stephen's stomach, Helga's hip, right? Danny's, never mind, right? Like, it's just, man, we have all these things that we pray for in uh, prayer meetings. If you've ever been to a prayer meeting, it's, it's usually about 45 minutes of just... Here's all the aches and pains that we have, and we want to go to the Lord for them. That's number two. A third category that was pretty high, and I was kind of interested by, was a full 6% of what Americans pray for are unspoken prayers. Unspoken prayers. I don't know what that is, but that's, yeah, that's a category, I guess. Um, and, so, and, and again, none of those things are bad. It's not bad to pray for events coming up in your life. It's definitely not bad to pray for people who are suffering or hurting, that God would minister to them. Um, but according to that survey, a full 80% of what American Christians pray for has very little to do with Jesus' mission and Jesus' message for the world, right? And, and so we kind of need to ask ourselves, like, are we praying the priorities of the scripture in our prayer life? And, and what I found a couple years ago is that I wasn't. And I was having a hard time praying because all I was doing was going to my Google calendar. You know, I was like, Lord bless this meeting, Lord bless that coffee, and, you know. And so, man, I needed something that would root me deeper than just the events that I had coming up and the things that were hurting in my body and the bodies of those that I cared about. Um, and, and so I've just asked the question, what we're going to ask the question today is, man, what did Jesus pray for? If we want to know what we should pray for, it's good to start by asking, well, what did Jesus pray for? This is the last time that Jesus prays for his disciples. Think about that. He's invested in these men for three years. He's about to go and be with the Father. This is the last time he prayed for them. What did he pray for them in that holy moment? He prayed three things for them. These are the three things he prayed for them, and I would suggest these are the three things that we should pray for ourselves, and we should pray for people that we love and that we care about. It's at least a good starting point. He said, Father, sustain them, sanctify them, 
and send them. He didn't talk about any events. He didn't talk about any health issues. He didn't talk about any physical needs. He said, I want you to sustain them, sanctify them, and send them. And I would suggest to you that that is where our prayers should start as well for ourselves and for those that we love. So what we're going to do is walk through these verses, and I'm going to kind of pull out each of those categories so that we might learn to pray for the same things that Jesus prayed for, okay? All right, verse 6. Remember, we're jumping right into Jesus' prayer. He says, Father, I have manifested your name to the people whom you gave me out of the world. Yours they were, and you gave them to me. Okay, the word manifest means to reveal or to show. Jesus said, I have manifested your name to the world. That's what this, this is what that means. Jesus makes the invisible God visible. Jesus makes the invisible God visible. That's what he did. So if you've ever wondered how God relates to sexual sinners, look at how Jesus related to sexual sinners. If you've ever wondered how does God relate to Broken people, look at how Jesus related to broken people. If you've ever wondered how does God relate to divorced people or to people with children who have special needs or to people who have been abused or to people who are suffering or people who have screwed up or people who have done a lot of wrong things, just go through the Gospels and look at how Jesus relates to them and that is how God relates to them. Because you see, God is not a force, God has a face. God is a person and we meet that person in the person and work of Jesus Christ. He manifested the Father to us. He said, I've manifested your name to the people whom you gave me. Okay, so now he's going to start talking about his people. He's going to start talking about his disciples. And look at what he says. It's kind of confusing. He says, these are the people whom you gave me out of the world. They, yours they were, you gave them to me. What does that mean? Well, Jesus is saying, my disciples belong to the Father before they believed in me. You see that? He's saying, they belong to you before they believed in me. And in fact, they only believed in me because they already belong to you. I'm like, I'm not, what's going on, Josh? My head hurts, right? Here's, here's what Jesus is saying. If you are a Christian, your salvation has very deep roots. Okay, the reason these 12 disciples, the 11 disciples followed Jesus was because in eternity past, God the Father had chosen them. They already belonged to him. Here's what this means. Long before you became concerned about your spiritual state, long before you started reading the Bible or going to that, you know, ministry or going to that church service, man, God had already architected your salvation. Man, in, in his mind and in his heart, in eternity past, he had chosen you. And the reason you believed the gospel when you heard it was because you already belonged to the Father. Your head hurt yet, right? Like you're like, what, how does this all work? Why does this matter, Josh? Well, it's not intended to confuse us. It's intended to comfort us. Because here's what I know, when life gets really hard, when things don't go as you expect, when people disappoint you or hurt you, man, it can feel like God has forgotten you. But friends, it is impossible for God to forget you because he's been thinking about you from eternity past. You have been in the heart and the mind of God since before time began. That is how deep your salvation goes. It's intended to comfort us. It's also intended to humble us because it means that your salvation doesn't have anything to do with you. It has everything to do with God. It's not like God was a coach in the major leagues and he saw how well you were performing at the AAA level. And he was like, I'm bringing her up. You know, like, man, her batting average is great. She's praying a ton. She's reading the scriptures. Have you seen her evangelism scores? She's coming up. We're bringing her up to heaven. It's gonna be great. No, like God didn't see our performance and call us up. In fact, if you're anything like me, I didn't come to faith in Christ out of a season of great moral victory. I came to faith in Christ out of a season of great moral failure. And it was my moral failures that showed me I needed a savior. You see, it's, it's not because we were so great that we came to Christ. It was that God had chosen us in eternity past. I love what Charles Spurgeon, an old English preacher, said. It's a good thing God chose me before I was born because he surely would not have afterwards. Amen. Everybody says amen. All right. Jesus continues in verse 7. They have kept your word. Now they know that everything that you have given me is from you. For I have given them the words that you gave me, and they have received them, and have come to know in truth that I came from you, and they have believed that you sent me. Word, words, or truth shows up 10 times in this section of the prayer. Real quick, in the Gospel of John, when you see word singular, that's referring to the gospel message. Jesus died for sinners. When you see words, plural, that's referring to all of the scriptures, the whole counsel of God. Here's what Jesus is saying in verse 7. I didn't come sharing my own ideas. Jesus said, these aren't my words. I received the word of God, and then I shared the word of God. And in verse 8, Jesus says, the reason that these these are my disciples. What set them apart as my disciples is that they received my word and they believed it. You see, then and now, what sets someone apart as a true disciple is that you receive the word of God, you don't edit the word of God. You receive the word of God, you don't reject the word of God. 
Jesus the son didn't get down into first century Palestine and be like, whoa, father, like, have you seen the culture? Have you seen where we are? We need to kind of update these ideas. We need to modernize this book a little bit. Like, I don't think that's going to work with this group. What if we did it this way? No, the son received the truth of the father and he shared it, right? And what true disciples do today is we receive the word of Christ and we share it. So what does it mean in our lives practically to receive the word of God? Well, it means two things. It means that we have to know it, and that means that we have to obey it. Okay, you can't receive something you don't know. So initially, you have to know the word of God. Well, how do you grow in knowing the word of God? Well, you know, you can have a, a quiet time where every day you spend 15 or 20 minutes studying the scriptures, going through Bible studies, just learning the scriptures better. You want to make sure that you and your family are part of a church that's teaching the scriptures week in and week out. So you're learning, you're growing in the word, your kids are growing in the word, right? There's all kinds of other podcasts and ministries that you can involve in to just know the word of God. That's really, really important. We know the word of God. We also, though, if we're going to receive it, have to obey the word of God. Because, I mean, here's what we all know. It's easy to know what the Bible says, but not do what the Bible says. Right? I mean, whole areas of my life for a very long time, I knew what it said. I just didn't want to do it. Right? Like, I knew what it said about generosity and forgiveness and about care for the poor. I just didn't want to do it. And what happens when we know the word of God, but we don't do the word of God, is that we confuse everyone. We confuse the world. And some of you maybe grew up in this. Maybe you grew up in churches like this. We have a guy on our staff who grew up in a church or grew up in a school like this. It was a Christian school, but none of the families or students there lived like Christians. So he was very confused his whole life until he went away to college. He was like, I guess Christians are just people who say something on Sundays, but then act totally. He was like, I would hear those guys. They would say all the answers in chapel. And then like they were the guys hosting the Ragers on Friday night. And I was just like confused. I was like, I guess this is just what it means to be a Christian. I went to um, Singapore one time on a mission trip and I was talking to people there about Christianity and they said, oh, Britney Spears? And I was like, oh no. <laughs> like, but that, I mean, that is literally what they thought of as Christianity. Somebody who, you know, at one point wore a cross necklace, but, you know, has a life that's not in line with the word of God, right? So we not only have to know the word of God, but we also have to obey the word of God if we're gonna be able to say that we have received it. So what set the disciples apart then and what sets true disciples apart today is that we, we know the word of God man, and we're applying it in our lives, not perfectly, man, but faithfully over time. All right, verse 10. All mine are yours and yours are mine. And I'm glorified in the, I'm sorry, back, did I miss? Yeah, here we go. We're good. All right, verse nine. I am praying for them. Okay, so Jesus is saying, hey, I am praying for my disciples. I am not praying for the world. Oh, what? That, that sound is in the Greek, actually. Um, but for those whom you've given me, for they are yours. So this is confusing. Jesus says, I'm praying for my people. I'm not praying for the world. That's kind of a strange thing to hear Jesus say, right? It's like, I thought Jesus loved the world. Why isn't he praying for the, praying for the world? Well, you need to understand how the word world is used in the Bible. So it's used in a number of different ways. Kind of like the word ball. So if I said to you, like, hey, throw me the ball, that's one thing. If I said, like, hey, we had a ball, that's another thing. If I said, like, we're going to the ball, right? Like, that's a, that's a third thing, right? Same word, different meaning. Same thing with the word world. In John chapter 1, when it says, God made the world, it's referring to the universe, to everything that there is. In John 3, 16, where it says, for God so loved the world that he sent his one and only son, that's the people of the world. And in 1 John 2, when it says, do not love the world or the things in the world, that's the value system of the world. You see, Jesus loves the people of the world. Jesus does not love the value system of the world. Jesus is strongly against the value system of the world. Jesus is strongly against any person or behavior or set of values or ideology that sets itself up against God and his rule and reign in our lives. So Jesus said, look, I'm praying for my disciples. I am not praying for the world. Verse 10, all mine are yours and yours are mine and I'm glorified in them. And I am no longer in the world, but they are in the world and I am coming to you. So remember that Jesus is preparing his disciples for his departure. He says, I'm coming to you. They're going to still be in the world. I'm out of here. Because in just a few hours, Jesus is going to be arrested. He's going to be crucified. He's going to die. Be buried. Three days later, he's going to rise, spend 40 days with his disciples afterwards, and then he's going to ascend to the, to the right hand of the Father. And he has not been back bodily since. So everything is about to change for his disciples. Jesus is about to be away from them. He's been with them physically for three and a half years. He's about to be away from them. So what does he do when he's not going to be with them physically? He intercedes for them spiritually. That's something that you can do as well. Man, you, maybe you have somebody that you care about that you can't be with physically anymore. Maybe, you're, maybe your kids are going to class. You can't be with them in school. Maybe your kids are going to college. You can't be with them in college. Maybe your sister lives on the West Coast. You can't be with her on the West Coast. Maybe your spouse is deployed. Maybe you're in a long-distance relationship. You can't be in the same town with your boyfriend or your girlfriend. And man, it's really, really hard, and you want to be there. What can you do? Well, you can pray for them. 
Prayer is the shortest distance between two people. Jesus is like, hey, I'm going to go to the Father, so I'm going to pray for them, and I want to get them ready for my departure. And now he gets to the very first thing he prays specifically for them. Verse 11, Holy Father, keep them in your name, which you have given me, that they may be one, even as we are one. While I was with them, I kept them in your name, which you have given me. I have guarded them, and not one of them has been lost, except the son of destruction, that the scripture might be fulfilled. But now I am coming to you, and these things I speak in the world, that they may have my joy fulfilled in themselves. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them, because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. The first thing that Jesus prayed for his disciples is that God would sustain them. That God would sustain them. Notice that Jesus used the word keep or protect four times in this section. He's saying, Father, while I was with them physically, I guarded them, I protected them, I made sure that they endured, but I'm leaving. And so I need you to do it. Father, I need you to protect them and guard them and keep them believing and keep them persevering and keep them repenting because it's going to be hard. Because now that they've accepted my word and now that they've left the world and they're following me, the world hates them. And the world is going to press on them. And the world is going to come at them. And they need help, so protect them. The first thing that you should pray for yourself and for your loved ones, and for me, if you think about it, is this, sustain me. Sustain me. The word sustain means to strengthen or support. Here's what you should do. God, give me a long view of my life. Help me live for a good legacy and not just for a good time. Like, help me think 40 years down the road. Lord, help me follow, be following you for decades. Help me to become a godly grandpa one day. Help me to become a godly grandma one day. One of the problems in our society right now is no one thinks they're ever going to get older than 40. Seriously, everyone acts like they're never going to get older than 40. But like you are and I am, hopefully, and then what? You know, it's like then you got, there's like all kinds of life to live. So we should just pray like, God, give me a long view of life. Man, help me to keep repenting and keep believing and keep serving and keep giving. Help me to keep pressing on. This is what you should pray for your loved ones. God, God, keep my kids in your name. Man, keep them believing the truth. God, they're going to college. It's so tempting. Keep them repenting. Man, they're in a new city. They're out of all their support systems. God, keep them in your name. Father, my sister is going through this really, really hard season of suffering. Lord, keep her. Lord, my, my friend is going through this really, really messy divorce. Father, keep him. Right? The reason it's so important that we ask God to sustain us and sustain the people that we love is it is so easy to quit. It is so easy to compromise. It is so easy to give up. Man, because we're not part of the world. If you're a follower of Jesus, you're not part of the world. So your whole life is swimming upstream. Everything that comes at you all day, every day is the opposite of what the scriptures say. You ever get tired of that? You ever get exhausted with that? You ever be like, I just want to be able to turn on my television and not have something that's screaming at me that is opposite of God's word. Right? It's, it's just hard. And so it's really easy to compromise, it's really easy to give up, it's really easy to quit. And honestly, our cultural moment has made this even harder. Because did you know 200 years ago, if you didn't like your job, or you didn't like where you lived, or you didn't like your spouse, you just had to deal with it? You just did. It was like, I'm sorry you don't like being a farmer, there's nothing else you can do, you know? It's like, congratulations, figure it out, you know? Like, sorry I don't like that you live in rural Kansas, you can't go anywhere else, you know? Uh, or I'm sorry you don't like your spouse, you can't just get divorced and you know, get on Tinder or whatever. It's just like, there, you, there was no changing, so you just, you just sort of had to figure it out, and it was like, you just had to tough it out and, and make the best of it. Well, that, you know, that's just not the case anymore. Um, I mean, think about it. If you don't like a professor, what can you do? You can just change classes, change majors, right? If you don't like your school, you can just transfer. If you don't like your job, you can just resign, get on Indeed, find a new one. Right? If you don't like your city, well, that's okay. You're, you know, your lease is pretty short. You can just move to a new city. Right? If you don't like your, I don't know, cell phone provider, you can just get a different one. Right? If you don't, I mean, honestly, if you don't like your spouse, I mean, no-fault divorce, right? You can just get divorced and, and start over and find somebody new. I, our, our culture just makes it very hard for us to do hard things. And um, I was convicted about this personally because I realized over the last two years, multiple times, I've signed my kids up for youth sports. And then when I realized how much time and energy it was going to take, I pulled them out of them. And I just got really convicted about that because I was like, I'm teaching my kids that when it's hard, it's okay to quit. That's what I'm teaching them. My parents never let me do that. Like, I did some things I did not want to do because my parents were just like, look, you signed up for it, so I hope you enjoy Odyssey of the Mind until Christmas, okay? Like, and we got some OM people out there, right? I, there's just, that was like our value of our family. You are not allowed to quit things. 
And so I've just realized that, man, it, it's, it's hard generally to endure in life. And then it's even harder spiritually. It's just harder spiritually because, man, we're, we're always swimming upstream. So, so, man, we just need to pray, God, sustain me. Man, keep me repenting. Man, keep me humble. Keep me believing. Keep me serving. Keep me growing. You know, one of the saddest things um, about growing older is just all the people that I know, that I care about, family, friends, people I was in college ministry with, that at one point claimed Jesus as their Savior and their Lord who aren't following him anymore. And I don't know if you know people like that. It's one of the most heartbreaking things uh, about being a pastor. And, you know, I don't know why that is. I mean, I think there's a lot of reasons why people stop believing. I think there's a lot of reasons why people give up. Um, honestly, college is sometimes the reason. Man, people just get really enthralled with the things of the world, and they, and they never come back. Uh, COVID was a big one. I mean, it was just like people were already struggling, and then they got disconnected from the church and Christian community, and maybe they got hurt, they got scared, whatever, and just a huge amount of people are just gone that, that were following the Lord before. Um, suffering can be one. Like, people are walking with the Lord, and then just some sort of serious season of suffering comes into their life, and they just don't know how to process it. Sexuality is a big one. So sometimes people decide the most important thing about me are my sexual desires, and so I need to express those sexual desires no matter what. And if God doesn't affirm me in that, then I don't affirm God anymore. So that's one of them. Sometimes it's just some relationship. Maybe you've seen this. You're like, oh, I just want God to strike that guy with lightning. That's what I want to have happen. We're going to go Old Testament on that dude. You know, like he's just bad news and you just see him. I'm serious. I'll pray that. Like, it's just like he is leading that sweet girl astray and you see it, and, but you can't talk to her, right? You've seen this happen. Maybe this has happened to you. Right? We, we just, man, it's, it's hard to endure. So, man, we just need to pray. God, sustain me. I mean, if you want to pray one thing for me, seriously, just pray that. God, just sustain Josh. Just, like, keep me repenting and keep me humble and keep me hungering and thirsting after righteousness. Um, John Piper is a famous pastor. He's done an incredible job in, in Minnesota. He prays the same thing every morning. He prays, God, keep me a Christian and keep me married. Those are two things he prays every day. And I thought, man, that's a pretty good prayer. And if you need more evidence of the importance of this prayer, just look at verse 12. I have guarded them, and not one of them has been lost, except the son of destruction. Who is the son of destruction? It's Judas. So just, just hours before this prayer, Judas had actually left the group to go and betray Jesus into the hands of the chief priests. Jesus said, look, the 11 disciples are going to make it, but not Judas. Judas. So let's talk about Judas for a minute, because Judas is a, I mean, he is a sober warning. Who was Judas? Well, he was one of the 12 disciples. He was chosen by the Lord. He spent three and a half years with Jesus, but then in the end, betrayed him for 30 pieces of silver. So what do we learn from him? Well, first, we learn that you can walk with God's people, but not walk with God. I mean, he was with the disciples. He was in the group. He was in a missional community. He had a fantastic MC leader. Like, he was with God's people. He didn't know God. Here's another one. You can be baptized and not be a believer. He had been baptized, right? And yet, in the end, not a believer. Here's, this, was really, this was really startling. I mean, he had sat under phenomenal Bible teaching for three and a half years. He, he went to the right church. He sat under the great preacher, right? He could give you the Bible references and the scripture. This one's sobering. He was in church leadership. I mean, he was one of the apostles. And one of the other... Gospels tells us that he was in charge of the money. Well, who do you let be in charge of the money? The guy that you trust. So like, no one saw this coming with Judas. He looked like everybody else, and yet in the end, he had never actually received the word of Christ into his heart. He had never actually been born again. He had never actually repented and believed. Man, that is a sober warning for all of us. And it's why in 2 Corinthians chapter 13, Paul says, examine yourselves to see whether you are in the faith. It's why in 2 Peter 1, verses 10 to 11, Peter says, be all the more diligent to confirm your calling. The Puritans used to call this the discipline of self-examination. It's kind of an uncomfortable process. But you kind of look at your life, you try to step out of, outside of yourself and be like, man, am I, do I bear the fruit of a Christian? You examine your heart, you examine your motives, you examine your schedule and your budget and your priorities, and you say, do I look like a Christian? Right? You, and it's awkward, and it's, and it's hard, and it's a little bit sobering, but... Man, if only Judas would have practiced self-examination. So when it comes to men fighting the good fight of the faith and finishing your race and keeping the faith, I, I want to explain something to you. There's, there's what we're called to do and there's what God does, okay? What we're called to do is called perseverance. What God, is, what God does is what's called preservation. 
Okay, we persevere, he preserves. By the grace of God, we are called to preserve in the faith. So Jesus says so in Matthew 24, 13, and there are five passages in the book of Hebrews all calling us to persevere. So I'm called to persevere, that's my work. That's your work if you're a follower of Christ. So how do you do that? I'll give you a couple of practical things here. One of the first ways is by meditating on the scriptures. So in Psalm 119, David said, how can a young man keep his way pure? So how can I keep following you? He answers, by guarding it according to your word. So as you engage with the scriptures on a regular basis, the, the scriptures may encourage you, but they also convict you, and they reveal things that you didn't even know were there. They cut between bone and marrow, and they, and they, they reveal motives. So you meditate on the scriptures regularly. Another way to, to persevere is prayer. So again, Psalm, 19, or Psalm 139, David prays, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Man, try me and know my thoughts. See if there be any grievous way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. I try to do that this week, just say, like, Holy Spirit, show me areas in my life that I'm not seeing, but they're there. Like, I have blind spots, and the problem with the blind spot is it's a blind spot, right? You can't see blind spots. So sometimes you just need the Spirit to, like, show it to you and be like, I, there's a whole area in my character and my life that if left undealt with is going to destroy me. Show me that. And then the third thing that the Scriptures give us is community. So Hebrews 3, 12, and 13 says, take care, brothers, lest there be in any of you an evil, unbelieving heart leading you to fall away from the living God. But exhort one another every day that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. You see, the local church is one of God's primary means of helping you persevere in the faith. That's why we talk about the weekender so much. That's why we talk about missional community so much, because we want to help you get connected to other people that are going to help you persevere in the faith. So one of the things about the last four years that have been really sweet is we've gotten to baptize dozens and dozens and dozens of people. And, um, and a lot of those people have professed faith in Christ for the very first time, and by God's grace are growing, and they're not perfect, but they're making progress, and they're here in our church, and it's amazing. I mean, like the Petrinos are an example of that. But one of the really sad things is that there are other people who have professed faith in Christ, who've been baptized here, who answered all the questions in the correct way, um, who are no longer walking with Jesus. And in almost every instance, the common denominator among those people is that they withdrew themselves from the church. Now, it wasn't always intentional. A lot of times, they were in Charlottesville, and they had, their job was fine, but they didn't love it. And then they got a job opportunity in another city. And people came around them and said, hey, I know you want to go to that other city, but you're really new in faith, and you've got this group that loves you and knows you. You've got this church you're growing and you're serving in. I'm afraid if you go to Richmond, or you go to D.C., or you go to Atlanta, or you go to Chicago, like, you're going to get disconnected. It's going to be bad. And they're like, no, 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 that definitely won't happen. Like, I'll definitely find a church. But unfortunately, most of them don't. And you know how it is, you get to a new city, you don't know anybody, you're working more than you should, and you're, and you're lonely, and you're disconnected from people, so you try to keep up for a while, and then you stop. And all of a sudden, you shrivel up spiritually. Now, why is that? Well, it's, it's because you've withdrawn yourself from the environment God has given you to help you persevere, right? And so, so that's why we love to recommend churches. When be, I'm like, I don't want you to go to any church, I want you to go to this church, okay? And here's James, he's the pastor, here's an email, you know? Because we want to help you be connected to the church. And maybe you've experienced this. I know I have. When you're in a season of not being connected to the people of God, you just kind of shrivel up spiritually, don't you? For two years after graduation, my wife and I were faithfully pursuing the Lord personally. But, I mean, we were just, the church that we were going to was dead and lifeless. Man, we really struggled. And then when we got connected to a healthy local church, man, God just started to do some really incredible things in our lives. So that's the, kind of the third way that God preserve that, that we, can, we can persevere in the faith. So what we do is we're called to persevere. What God does is the ministry of preservation. And these are all the Bible verses that I like, okay? These are the ones that you put on your coffee mugs, all right? Philippians 1.6, anybody know this one? Right, Philippians 1.6, and I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Christ Jesus, amen. Jude, verse 23, God is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before him. Praise the Lord. <laughs> John 10.27, my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life and no one will snatch them out of my hand. Praise God. We persevere, God preserves. And here's the thing, they're taught right next to each other in the scriptures. So Philippians 2, 12 and 13 says this, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. What's that? Your work, my work. What's the next verse? For it is God who works in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. That's his work. So I don't know exactly how it works together, but somehow they don't contradict, they're complementary. And so here's what we should do. Man, we should ask God to sustain us. We should pray and say, God, sustain me. If I wander away, send someone to come get me. Right? And then we should devote ourselves to fighting the good fight. Okay? That's the first thing Jesus prays. All right, he continues in verse 16. They, his disciples, and if you are a disciple, you, are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. 
So Jesus' second request for his disciples is sanctify them. Sanctify means to set apart for a holy purpose. So in the Old Testament, there were these utensils used in the temple, and they were sanctified. They were set apart only to be used for the worship of God in the temple. So what that meant is you didn't use the same spoon to offer incense and eat your oatmeal, okay? It was like they were only used for holy purposes. Jesus is now applying that to you. Jesus is saying, look, I want you to be set apart for the Lord's purposes. Just like those vessels were set apart to the Lord's purposes in the Old Testament, I'm now applying that to every one of my followers, that we would be set apart to the Lord's purposes purposes. So here's the second thing that we should pray. You ready? Sanctify me. Sanctify me. Sanctify the people that I love. You see, what I found is that um, we often want to fit in, but Jesus wants us to stand out for good. We often want to fit in and, and not, you know, make any trouble, but Jesus is like, no, I'd like you to look very, very different at work. I'd like you to look very, very different in your grad program. I'd like you to look very, very different in your neighborhood for good. Like, I would like people to look at you and be like, there is something different about her or different about that family, and the answer is, man, Christ is working in you sanctify me. Sanctify is a very hopeful word because sanctify is both optimistic and realistic, okay? It's optimistic because it's like, hey, you're created in the image of God. You have the spirit of God dwelling within you. You have the word of God available to you. You're a part of the church of God. You can change, but it's also realistic. You need to change, okay? Like that's what it's saying. Sanctify is a hopeful word. It's like, hey, we've got some things to work on, but it's possible to work on it. Um, I, I would encourage you, remember the power of the word yet, the power of the word yet, so here's what we sometimes do. We sometimes think we can't change. You know who the only person is that can't change? God. You can change. I can change. So here's what sometimes happens. Well, I'm just, we just don't have a good marriage. Yet. Right? I'm not a good dad. Okay. Yet. Like, I don't know the Bible very well. Yet. Right? Like, just insert. Like, I'm not good at prayer. Yet. Like, I don't know how to share the gospel. Yet. Like, I could never lead. I can't lead a group. Yet. Right? It's just a very hopeful word. Because the Holy Spirit is inside of you, you can do all sorts of things. And the good news of the gospel is that you don't have to peak spiritually like when you peak physically, okay? I'm on the down end side of my physical peak, okay? Like I woke, for the last two weeks, I've woken up and my left hand has been sore. I haven't done anything to it. Like I haven't done any, it's just so, I don't know why. It's just sore. Like I am not at my peak physically anymore. But the good news is you can be in your 80s and peaking spiritually, right? Because you're just growing and being sanctified by the Spirit. So sanctify me is a very hopeful prayer. And you know what else? It's the very best thing God can give your loved ones. Do you know what the best thing God could give to your wife is? A godly version of you, right? Like, isn't the best thing that your kids need is like a godly set of parents? And like the best thing that God could send into your, your, I don't know, classmate's life is like the most sanctified version of you? Man, that's what God wants to do. He wants to sanctify you, set you apart, change you, and then make you a blessing to the people that are all around you. So how does that happen? Well, Jesus tells us one of the major ways that happens is in the truth or through the truth. Jesus says you are sanctified in truth, and then he says your word is truth. So here, here's what that means. Jesus did not believe and does not believe that truth is relative. Jesus doesn't believe that truth is culturally conditioned or that truth is personally developed or that truth depends on your experience. According to Jesus, truth is what accords with reality, and that truth is contained in the Holy Scriptures, in the Word of God. But if you're a Christian, it is the fight of your life to believe that. Because we live in a world that, for a large part, rejects that. And Satan has been lying to the people of God from the very beginning. Think about the Garden of Eden. What did Satan do with Adam and Eve? He lied to them in three different ways. Same ways he lies to us today. Here's the first thing that he said. He said, did God really say? What is that? He's calling them to doubt God's word. Oh, man, this is an, it's an old book. Written mostly by men. In the, I mean, you just, it's antiquated. We're so modern now. We have HVAC and indoor plumbing. Certainly, this doesn't apply to us now. Right? So, so Satan first said, did God really say? The, the next thing that he did uh, was he said, God's holding out on you. He said, if you eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you'll become like God. But God didn't want that. See, his word is intended to repress you. God doesn't want you to be fulfilled. God doesn't want you to be happy. If you would just live your life how you want to live your life, then you'd be happy. But if you were biblical, you'd be miserable. That's the second lie. Third lie is there won't be any consequences. Satan said, hey, no, you definitely won't die. I'm confident of that. Right? Isn't this crazy? This is literally what Satan lies to us and says. He says, hey, look, you can violate the very design of the creator, and you can do something that has led to death and destruction in the lives of millions of people throughout all of history, definitely won't happen to you, though. Like, you are for sure the exception to, to this universal truth. It's just, it's just a lie, right? 
but we're all, we all hear those lies every single day. We're, you're going to hear those lies tonight, right? Like, man, I can't, do I really, am I really supposed to apply the Bible literally? Like, that seems like a lot. It's like so different than the world that I live in. Or like, you know what? If I, if I did what God said with my money or with my relationships or with my sexuality, gosh, I'd be so miserable. Or how about this one? Like, nobody's ever going to know. This is just a me thing. Like, nobody's going to be hurt by this, right? Like, there won't be any consequences. Man, that's the same, those are the same lies that Satan has been whispering into the ears of people for a very, very long time. And so what we need to pray is, God, sanctify me. Sanctify me in the truth. Lord, don't allow me to be conformed to this world, but cause me to be transformed by the renewal of my mind. And pray that for your kids. And pray that for me. And pray that for, for your loved ones. God, sanctify us according to your truth. Help us to be people that know and love and delight in your truth. Okay, verse 18, Jesus continues, as you sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. 17 times in the Gospel of John, Jesus says, the Father has sent me into the world. Jesus is always thinking about mission, right? And he's always praying about mission. And he prays for his disciples and says, Father, just like you've sent me to carry out your commission, now I'm praying that you would send them to carry out my commission. Here's the last thing that we should pray for ourselves. Send me. Send me. You know, what's interesting is that Jesus loved the world, but he prayed for the church. You know why? Because the church is his instrument for reaching the world. So if you want to pray for Charlottesville, you should pray for the churches here. And if you want to pray for UVA, you should pray for the Christians and the ministries that are on grounds. And if you want to pray for some nation of the earth, you should pray for the underground churches there. That the believers would be sanctified in truth, that they would live out of their identity as missionaries. Guys, here's the honest truth. If our prayers never transcend our circumstances and our desires, we've missed the missionary heart of Jesus. At some point, we have to pray, Father, prepare me. Father, give me eyes to see people who need you and give me the boldness to take those opportunities. Help me to do what Bailey did and just have eyes to see and the boldness to start a relationship and to extend an invitation. That's what decon is about. It's just about inspiring and equipping us to do what Jesus has called us to do. That's what back to school weekend is about at the end of August. That's why we're adding a third service so that we can just create room so that people can come and see. So here's a convicting question. This is a dangerous question to ask. You ready? If God answered every one of your prayers from last week, how many more people would be in the kingdom of God? Right? Would, like, would there be one less unreached people group? Would your family be totally different? Would, would awakening have happened at UVA? Or would like your meeting have gone well and you know, your body would ache less and your traveling mercies would have been delivered? It's a, it's a convicting question to ask. I have a, a mentor named Daniel Henderson who asked this question. I was like, ooh. He said this, why do we spend so much time asking God to heal people and keep them out of heaven and so little time asking God to rescue people from going to hell? Right? It's not bad to, to pray that God would work in someone's life and, and would heal them. But like if it's Miss Dottie and she's 96 and like she's like she wants to go, you know, like she's ready, <laughs> like let her go. Man, but how much are we just laboring in prayer and, and man, just on our knees for our neighbors and for our family members and, and for, the, you know, our kids' classmates? Man, do our prayers represent the, the missionary heart of Christ? Um, growing up, uh, my wife lived next to a woman named Linda Hamilton. Linda Hamilton loves the Lord. Linda started praying for my wife when my wife was six years old. Uh, she never, she hasn't stopped. She's in her 70s now. Uh, Linda prayed for Meredith for 11 years before Meredith came to Christ. And when she came to Christ, she said, I've been praying for your salvation for 11 years. She kept praying for Meredith. She started praying for her spouse. And then we got married, and Linda's like, I've been praying for you for like 11 years. And then she started praying for our marriage, and then she started praying for the church plan. And I was thinking about this this week, and I thought, man, how, how much of Meredith's life and my life and now your life has been shaped by the prayers of Linda Hamilton? And think about that. You could be Linda Hamilton for somebody. That six-year-old kid on your street who doesn't have a dad, I mean, you can start praying for him right now. And in, in 30 years, he might be planning a church in Portland. And he'll look back and he would say like, oh man, how much of my life has been shaped by my neighbor on that street who's been praying for me for 30 years? Man, so Jesus said, send them, send me. Last verse, he says this, and for their sake, I consecrate myself that they also may be sanctified in truth. What does that mean? Well, to consecrate means to set yourself apart for the will of God no matter what. So if you consecrated something in the Old Testament, you couldn't get it back. 
I consecrate it to the Lord. I can't, if I consecrate this animal, this vessel, this, this thing, I, I don't get it back. And this is what Jesus is saying. I have consecrated myself to the purposes of the Lord. I'm going to pray this prayer, and then I've got to go do something. I've got to go do the thing I came to earth to do. I need to go die for the sins of the world. You see, no one can be sustained, and no one can be sanctified, and no one can be sent unless I first consecrate myself. That's what Jesus is saying. Um, if we're honest, prayer is really hard. And praying the priorities of God is even harder. And so the question is, where do we get the, the power and the strength and the motivation to do it? How do we learn to pray like Jesus? Well, we learn to pray like Jesus by looking at the cross of Jesus. You see, the reason I can pray is because Jesus died. The reason you can be sanctified unto life is because Jesus was set apart. He was sanctified unto death. The reason that we can become the link between our friends and God's grace is because Jesus at great cost to himself became the link between God's grace and us. When I fix my eyes on the cross of Christ, it motivates me to pray like Christ. I said earlier um, in this sermon that this was the very last time that Jesus prayed for his disciples, and that was true in one sense. It was the last time he prayed for them on earth. But we know from the rest of the story that Jesus would, would die on the cross, he'd be buried, he'd rise again. And then he would ascend to the right hand of the Father. And that's where he is right now, presently at the right hand of the Father in glory. And so the question is, what is Jesus doing there? And the answer of the scriptures from 1 John 2, Hebrews 7, and Romans 8 is that right now in this very moment, Jesus is praying for you. That Jesus is interceding on behalf of on your behalf with the Father. He's saying, Father, sustain her. Sustain her. I know what's going on in her relationship. I know what's going on at work. I know that she's getting older and she's dropping her standards and she just really wants to be in a relationship. Sustain her, Father. Don't let her believe the lies of the world that she has to be in a relationship to be happy. He's saying, God, sanctify him. He's in a new grad program. He's trying to fit in. He hasn't been reading the scriptures. He hasn't been praying. He hasn't really been involved in the church. Father, don't let him go. Sanctify him. Make him salty. Make him bright in that place. He's praying, God, send them. I know that they're overwhelmed by their own life and their own issues. And I know left to their own devices, they're just going to think about themselves and their convenience and their comfort. Don't let them. God, send them into that community. Send them around the world with your hope and with your power and with your grace so that more people might come to know you. Right now, Jesus Christ is praying for you. So how do you need to pray in response to that reality? If you'd bow your heads with me, I just want to give you a couple things to think about. How do you need to respond to the prayers of Jesus Christ for you? Maybe you need to start praying these categories for your life. Honestly, maybe you need to stop praying that God would make you successful and start praying that God would sanctify you. Maybe it's your kids. Maybe you've been praying for your kids' happiness. And that's okay. Maybe you need to start praying for your kids' holiness. God, don't give them the happiest life they can have. Give them the holiest life that they can have. Or maybe you're here and truly Jesus actually isn't praying for you because you've never received his word. And you're, you're not one of his. You're, you're of the world. That can change. You can become one of Jesus' disciples through simple repentance and faith. What does that mean? It means you pray to Jesus and you say, Jesus, I admit I'm a sinner. I deserve condemnation. But I believe that you have done everything necessary for my salvation. And I'm surrendering to you as my Savior and my Lord. Jesus loves to hear that prayer. He loves to pray for people who pray it. Lord Jesus, thank you that you're interceding for us. Pray that you would make us a church that intercedes for one another.